All right, so welcome everyone. Uh, it is my great pleasure to introduce Sultan Hyman from Columbia University, uh, who is our Steve Murray Distinguished Visitor this week. And Sultan <coughs> just uh, well, arrived yesterday, so he was here this morning, and he will be here until Friday early afternoon. Uh, so if you, if you want to meet, if you want to meet with him, then please sign up on the visitor schedule, which I circulated earlier today. So, Sultan uh, finished his PhD actually at Harvard University, and according to, uh, to him, he spoke in this very same room last time when he finished his PhD, when he gave his dissertation, <laughs> dissertation colloquium. He has given other talks, obviously, but most of those have been taken in, uh, put place in press. Uh, so he finished his PhD and his advisor was Avi, and the title of his, his, his PhD thesis was Formation and Signatures of the First Stars and Quasars. And I think he hasn't gone very far from that. <laughs> so after finishing his thesis, he was research assistant at Fermilab and then a Hubble Fellow at Princeton. After that, he moved to a faculty position at Columbia, and he's still at Columbia as a full professor. His main research interest is theoretical astrophysics and cosmology, which includes, of course, the first stars and black holes. And then he's also studying the subsequent evolution of black holes uh, to determine the nature of dark energy and dark, ma dark matter using large astronomical surveys. Okay. His current research interest includes the simulation of mergers, and he's going to talk about those, uh, mergers between black holes, and large-scale simulations of weak gravitational lensing, and to develop tools to extract cosmological information from non-Gaussian features of the stochastic gravitational landing feature. So his talk today will be about black holes, about merging supermassive black hole binaries. So thanks for coming and uh, thank you. Is this mic on? Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, it's an honor to be invited here. As uh, as uh, Akor said, I was here exactly 20, 20 years ago giving my uh, thesis talk of which I was reminded a month ago because uh, Luke gave a talk uh, of his thesis. I don't know if you were here. Uh, it was in the same room. And, uh, and if you want to, you could think of my talk as uh, a follow-up to his because he talked about merging black holes identified in illustrious simulations and uh, galaxies. And I'm going to zoom in and discuss what happens on smaller scales. Uh, <coughs> so this work. Uh, I will describe, basically will make the point that black holes can be more interesting when there's stuff around them, plasma, and uh, photons come out. And my collaborators are actually uh, at two institutions. So Columbia, we had three students who worked on this, one of whom is Dan Dorazio, who's, who's moved here and uh, is now a, a, a postdoc here, an Einstein Fellow. Uh, and then I collaborate, as, as I will describe, with a NYU uh, group. Uh, who provided a, a very nice code to do simulations with. And, uh, and Paul Doffel, actually the author of the code, is about to arrive here as a postdoc from the fall. He's now a postdoc at Berkeley. Uh, can you see the screen? Uh, so, uh, <coughs> so in this talk, I want to do basically three things. I hope to get to all three. One is to give you a broader introduction, since you're not all experts working in this field. Uh, of uh, observational background, why we expect massive black holes to be emerging in galactic nuclei, and we expect them to be often surrounded by gas, not just in vacuum, and why you actually care about this. Uh, then I want to discuss the bulk of this talk would be theory, uh, what happens when two black holes find themselves surrounded by a dense accretion disk, uh, and that's important for two reasons, uh, looking for electromagnetic emission, and also the dynamical evolution of the orbit of the black holes. And then I hope to get to observations. We think we identified some candidate binaries recently uh, in optical surveys for, as periodic quasars. And I want to hopefully move on to uh, the LISA era when uh, uh, we think LISA will find supermassive black hole mergers in gravitation waves and what we might expect to see uh, with X-ray and other telescopes concurrently with LISA. So now uh, I have to uh, uh, tell you something I learned recently. If, uh, yeah, Charles, you've seen this recently. Uh, if you've seen this, please don't speak. But I want to ask how many people here know where the word black hole comes from? Or who coined the word black hole? Just raise your hand. Who coined the word black hole? Okay. Uh, 
So let's see if you had the right answer. So this is my view from my office at Columbia University. Uh, and this, you can actually see the Empire State. This is actually from my office. Broadway is here. And I walk to my office through Broadway. I go past this building every morning. Now raise your hand if you recognize this building. <laughs> Only half the people. Yes. So, uh, so this is a, a restaurant on 112th Street and Broadway, just south of campus. And uh, it's also the Goddard Institute for Space Studies, which is a NASA institute uh, associated with Columbia, which occupies the floors above this restaurant. And uh, what I learned, well, actually, first I want to say that I learned that Stephen Murray actually went to Columbia as an undergraduate, uh, graduated in 65, so he also worked, walk, was walking past this building. It looked something like this at the time, or maybe 10 years older. Uh, so this is probably, yeah, 50s, so in between the two. In any case, he walked past this building. So uh, why am I showing this building? So this is John Wheeler, uh, who uh, I think, if you raise your hand, is credited usually with learning, learning uh, with coining the word uh, black hole. I saw he's credited for it, but it wasn't really. So, so I, this is what I read in his autobiography uh, <laughs> very recently. Uh, this is his uh, autobiography where he says in 1967 he was invited to give a talk at a conference at 2880 Broadway, uh, which is uh, this building, uh, GIS, Goddard Institute for Space Studies, where he gave a talk. The conference was about pulsars. And he said we should consider the possibility that the center of a pulsar is a gravitationally completely collapsed object. And then he remarked that one couldn't keep saying this long expression over and over. One needed a shorter phrase. How about black hole? Asked somebody in the audience. I've been searching for the right term for months mulling it over in the bed, etc. So he actually says in his book that he looked for a good word, which he was given by an anonymous person in 67, just above the Seinfeld restaurant, which I find very amusing. Uh, uh, I should say that Vittorio Canuto is still there, and I went and tried to find out more details who this person was, but I couldn't. And still there? Yes. Uh, and uh, he doesn't remember this. <laughs> So, <laughs> okay, so uh, I just thought this is a fun fact to learn. I was certainly amused. So uh, let me start with the motivation and introduction, which is actually, it turns out, it's almost super simple, the, the, the motivation. We know that uh, most galaxies, uh, at least major ones, unless it's a very small dwarf galaxy, contains a supermassive black hole in the range of 10 to the 6 to 10 to the 10 solar masses. And also that this correlates with the mass of the host galaxy. Uh, and uh, we also know that galaxies experience several mergers during their lifetimes. And so it's natural to therefore end up with two black holes in the middle uh, now of the merger product. Now, most galaxies also contain gas. This is also important because we know that uh, at few, ti few times 10 million solar masses, because of this correlation with the host galaxy, the black holes live in gas-rich spiral disk galaxies in the bulges. Uh, the most massive black holes might live in so-called dry ellipticals, uh, big galaxies, uh, which don't have that much gas, but they might still have often gas at least as much as the black hole, which is only 0.1% of the total mass of the galaxy. Now, during the merger, we think we understand quite well certain things. The black holes sink to the middle by dynamical friction on the dark matter and stars. Uh, and end up in the, the nucleus of the new galaxy. Moreover, the gas is also uh, end up being channeled to the center by torques between uh, stellar, stellar uh, non-exosymmetric stellar structures and gaseous bars which form in the merger by tidal forces. And so the gas also ends up being funneled to the center. So the common outcome of such mergers we expect is two black holes sitting in the middle of a galaxy surrounded by gas. So that's really simple. Uh, we see, of course, observationally, ga many interacting galaxies uh, are beautiful pictures, including ones which are very, very close by and clearly interacted and are in the process of merging. And uh, another important point is that uh, if they're surrounded by gas, these black holes can act like quasars, uh, very bright sources on the sky, 
and that's best uh, resolved in the x-rays. So this is uh, the most well-known uh, uh, image of an actually resolved dual uh, quasar in the x-rays. So the separation here on the sky, the two x-ray point sources are resolved by Ch uh, Chandra. It's about a kiloparsec separation. There are many examples of black holes which are further apart, tens or even 100 kiloparsec. They're so-called dual or offset AGN in the optical. The record holder is a radio galaxy. In radio, you can do interferometry. You can resolve close, more compact binaries. The record holder is a AGN uh, in the radio, very nearby galaxy, very bright, and it has two uh, cores, distinct cores in the radio. Projected separation is 7.3 parsec. Now, I should say that these numbers are small, and we therefore know that black holes can shrink at least to kiloparsec separations of the bulge. Uh, but in, in order for this to be a real binary, uh, you might define the so-called sphere of influence, where in the orbit of the black holes, uh, it actually dominates the mass. So then it's a true gravitationally bound binary, rather than two black holes going around in the nucleus. So for reference, that's about 10 parsec for a 10 to the 8 solar mass black hole embedded in a galaxy with a velocity dispersion of 200 kilometers per second. So uh, that's roughly uh, also where we think the binaries might stall because they can shrink down to this radius just by scattering, but by dynamical friction on the stars in the center of the host galaxy. But at this, roughly this radius, they eject the stars and it's a little unclear whether they can shrink further or not. There's a lot of debate about this, uh, which I don't uh, work on and don't particularly want to weigh in. However, at this stage, we think there's lots of gas. And you can ask what <laughs> gas does. Another number for reference to keep in mind, if you had only gravitational waves, so you couldn't shrink the binary uh, by uh, scattering stars or gas, it would just shrink by gravitational wave emission. So in order for that gravitational wave emission to result, to the, result in a merger in uh, 10 billion years, the separation has to be uh, essentially subparsec. So the largest 10 of the 10 solar mass black holes would merge from a parsec in Hubble time. The smallest ones, 10 of the 6, they would have to be at a milliparsec already. So therefore, I think this is, at least for myself, this is the most interesting regime to consider from a few parsec down to this stage where gravitation waves take over. Now, uh, this problem is actually very well defined then because uh, the gas we also believe will cool in the center of the galaxy and form a disk, which generally is thought to power luminous quasars. Uh, and it's a, uh, uh, in broad brush at least, well understood the accretion disk. And so uh, now if you have two black holes in such a disk, then you might be interested, as I mentioned, in three things. First, uh, does the interaction of the binary black hole with the disk uh, change its orbit and how uh, long does the orbit take to decay? Hopefully it will decay uh, due to the interaction with the gas disk. Uh, this, of course, is important because uh, it affects the observability. If you're looking for a survey or b for binary black holes, if they live for a long time at a particular orbital separation, you will be many more on the sky. It just goes linearly with the time it takes to move inward. Uh, and will affect the, if you ever have a sample of binaries, it will affect the distribution of periods or separations. Uh, the other thing you would obviously care about, how much gas is uh, accreted by the black holes in this binary stage and how this accretion takes place. Here the zeroth order question is just how much gas actually gets close to the black holes, given that there's a, a, a binary propeller motion. Uh, is it significantly different from a single quasar accretion disk? Uh, uh, in which case it would be dimmer object. And then also, what is the mode of the accretion? Is it uh, giving a similar spectrum? Is it time variable? These things you want to basically understand from, uh, from a kind of uh, simulations I will show. This ob obviously affects observability just through uh, total luminosity. If it accretes efficiently, it will be luminous. If not, it will be dimmer. And then the spectrum and the variability are something we need to understand. The third question, I don't think I actually talked about this today much, but you might also worry if the gas disk is efficient in pushing the black hole binary inward uh, and it causes in spiral, does it actually affect the gravitational waveform? If uh, people want to uh, measure gravitational waveforms with LISA, uh, 
uh, for example, do you have to worry that they're not vacuum waveforms? The gas slightly changes them. Uh, so uh, <coughs> these are important questions. And then the last motivating slide I want to just mention, uh, because much of this research I've started being motivated by Lisa, actually, even though Lisa is uh, uh, only 12 years away. Uh, I want to argue how, uh, how important it is to see photons from a gravitation wave binary. So just to very briefly recap, recap, the gravitation waves were detected already from a stellar mass binary by LIGO. Larger black holes in the range which is the lower end of the supermassive black holes. I think this is out of battery actually, but is there another? Uh, so the, 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 lo the lower mass end of this range can be probed by LISA at uh, lower frequencies. And then even lower frequencies will have ongoing pulsar timing array uh, uh, searches for gravitation waves going up to the largest black holes. And so if you detect the gravitation waves, that's already really great. Uh, and, but if you also, meet, uh, also di discover photons, uh, well, thanks a lot. Thank you. Thanks a lot. So if you also discover the photons and you find the electromagnetic counterparts to these LISA sources or pulsar timing sources, you can do at least two kinds of things. You can study accretion physics uh, for the first time uh, as a function of known black hole masses and orbital parameters and spins, which are all going to be available in principle from the LISA waveforms. Uh, and uh, that's, of course, a large part of astrophysics, predicting spectra and accretion processes onto complex objects. The other thing I like is in astronomy, uh, one of the other problems or themes is the evolution of uh, quasars and galaxies and why supermassive black holes co-evolve with their host galaxies. And uh, if we know uh, which LISA source lives in which galaxy and uh, what, how it behaves, we can actually study this cosmic evolution of these two populations. Then <coughs> there's also more fundamental physics you can do, which again requires both photons and gravitation waves. The most obvious one is the Hubble diagram. So I, I think <coughs> most people probably here know uh, that the, uh, one of the standard tools of cosmology is the standard candle, supernovae, where you, where you measure the redshift and then you figure out the distance after you calibrate the light curves. You can do the same thing with these objects. The distance will be provided by the gravitation wave observations but not the, spec, not the redshift. So you need the photons to measure a spectrum and get a redshift. Then you can do the Hubble diagram, the distance redshift relation. So that's the same exercise as supernovae, maybe not super exciting. Therefore, in that sense, however, it can uh, go to larger redshifts. Uh, it does everything in one step. And most interestingly, this diagram is not built on the same uh, uh, photons only as the supernovae. The supernova distance and uh, redshift are both from based on photon measurements, whereas here the distance is gravitation wave graviton measurements. So if there's anything strange with gravity and photons uh, don't uh, 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 propagate differently from gravitons, then we can discover it as a difference between these two Hubble diagrams. I think that's the most novel use of this so-called standard siren Hubble diagrams. We can also look for a rival time a difference between photons and the gravitation waves. I will actually hope to get to this in my talk. And that constrains the propagation speed relatively of gravitons and photons. Uh, and you can even uh, measure, uh, in principle, the mass of the graviton this way. Uh, and uh, which should, should just follow from this relation. So you measure the frequency from the gravitation waves uh, and that's the graviton energy, and it should be equal to this if the graviton is massive. And so if you measure a time, uh, measure gamma, the propagation speed from the time delay, you get the graviton's mass. That's a very simple exercise to do, and in fact, a similar thing was already done by LIGO. I this could be much more accurate if it's done with LISA source. If this relation depends on frequency, you can even test Lorentz invariance, and again, uh, these are just nice things, and both require photons and gravitation waves. So you have to actually know which source you're seeing on the sky and find the photons. The last obvious point is uh, the finding the electromagnetic counterpart of a LISA source can also help 
secure uh, low signal to noise detection with LISA and give you more confidence of that detection. Okay, so the, that was the motivation. Now I want to move on to the bulk of the talk. Uh, just to reference, by the way, this is the number of slides here. So uh, I hope I'm doing okay for now. This is the longest part. The, no, just the total number. Uh, so uh, so the, this is the theory part where I will discuss the evolution of a binary in, with a disk. And as I already kind of alluded to, uh, the picture is very simple uh, for the, the, the simulations I'll discuss, which is we think quasars are understood to have a thin, geometrically thin, optically thick accretion disk, which is stable out to some radius, at which the mass of the disk is too large, and then it starts to self-gravitate and imprints and uh, becomes gravitationally unstable and fragments into uh, presum presumably clumps and which turn into stars. So this region is actually not very well understood, even for quasars. Uh, and I'm just going to ignore this region and say, I'm interested in binaries which shrank to a separation w such that they are in this uh, parsec, few parsec or smaller stable accretion disk. And again, they can be delivered into that configuration just by scattering on stars in principle. Uh, and uh, somehow they maneuver through these unstable outer parts of the disk. But we do know from quasar observations, just the argument is that we do know that somehow nature manages to create an accretion disk uh, which explains quasars in general. So somehow gas is delivered through this region. And then we can ask the question, well, what happens if we put a second black hole companion here, which are in orbit? This disk, by the way, out to here has very little mass. So here, uh, if you look at the inner portion of the disk, it has very little mass compared to the masses of the black holes, which makes uh, studies of them easier. So. Uh, we do these simulations for the last few years, again in collaboration with uh, uh, people at NYU. Uh, and uh, here, are the f I don't want to spend too much time on the code. Uh, this is a, the code is called DISCO. Uh, it's an adaptive uh, uh, mesh refinement code which has a mesh which moves with the flow. So if you're familiar with Arepo, because people use it here a lot, uh, this is a non-cosmological version of Arepo. Uh, it's, we, do, we do 2D Newtonian hydrodynamics, so this is basically the simplest problem you can set up to study this problem. There's no general relativity or MHD, although in one case, if I get to it, I will describe a, a pseudo-Newtonian case where the black holes are so close we have to put in a, a modified potential. Uh, the viscosity in this disk uh, is just assumed to be an alpha viscosity, like for usual phenomenological description of quasar accretion disks. This allows gas to flow inward from the outer part of the simulation to the inner part. Uh, the, the, the code does allow for cooling and heating. So cooling is just from the surface of the disk. This disk has a temperature and it has a sigma t to the fourth black body emission from up and bottom of the disk. And then it's being heated. The gas is heated two ways. One is the viscosity is dissipation, which heats the gas, like in a standard shakura sonyaev disk but also in this gas experiences shocks, and that actually tends to dominate the heating, uh, as you will see. These black holes are followed, they're moving around on the grid, and they can accrete either uh, via sink prescription, so we, we actually resolve the gas flows around the individual black holes, and then decide how much of that to remove and put into the black hole, or in this case, which I'll get to, we actually don't need a sink because we resolve the innermost stable, stable orbit. Uh, one a couple of advantages of doing this very simple problem. So if you compare these two, there are groups which have alternative approach and doing 3D MHD or GR MHD simulations. The advantage of this approach is that you can do very high resolution and do many, many orbits. And the system, as you'll see, does take hundreds of orbits to settle down into a steady, quasi-steady behavior so that we can understand it. Uh, and we can also extend the disk to very large sizes so that outer boundary effects don't propagate in and disturb what's happening near the black holes. So typically we have a hundred times the separation of the binary is where the, out, the disk ends. And then we can run thousands of orbits and uh, for roughly speaking for a time which corresponds this time, thousand orbits of the binary, 
uh, for usual parameters, uh, listed for example these alphas, it corresponds to the viscous time of the gas near the black hole. So we can actually equi equilibrate uh, the system at least at a few binary separations. And then we can study the behavior of the system. I'm going to skip the one more, one more slide on the code which I'm going to skip except I should just say that this code is public. Paul Duffel was the main author of this code. He made it public uh, recently and you can also use it. The other thing from my perspective is we used to use Flash and uh, it gave us a lot of debugging and this one uh, accelerated this project a lot, this code. So it's a nice code. Uh, so in this, this setup, which I carefully uh, described, uh, I tiptoed around complications, and therefore I ended up with a problem which really has only three parameters, the, uh, of which the most interesting one is the ratio of the two black holes masses. Then we have the temperature of the disk and the viscosity of the disk. And those, the last two I'm not going to focus on because they don't qualitatively basically change anything I'm going to say. Uh, on the other hand, the mass ratio of the black holes does matter a lot. So here's a cartoon which gives up gives a punchline. If the mass ratio Q is very small, which means we have a stellar mass black hole almost, or a very uh, falling onto a supermassive black hole, uh, so less than 10 minus 4, then this represents a very small perturbation to a usual quasar disk. It, in fact, it's in the linear regime, and uh, we're not very interested in this in this talk because we're talking about supermassive black hole mergers in galactic nuclei. But just for pedagogical reasons, I listed it here. If you increase the mass of the secondary black hole to about uh, uh, 10 to minus 3 or 10 to minus 2, uh, that's becoming more interesting for cosmological black hole mergers. Uh, then the behavior changes. And the reason is that uh, the perturber now makes nonlinear perturbations in the disk. It, the gravitational effect of a perturber is to actually repel the gas somewhat ironically. Gravity tends to, uh, in, this, in, this, in this setup, the gravity tends to repel objects which are outside, just outside the orbit of the perturber outward, just inside the perturber inward. And if this perturber is strong enough to overwhelm viscosity, then it opens this gap. And then in the planetary literature, they call this type two migration. Uh, when there is a, where there's a distinct gap. So this is relevant uh, for very unequal mass ratio mergers. And then there's the most relevant case where the black, black hole masses are more equal, uh, maybe at most uh, discrepant by a factor of 100. And in that case, as I'll show you, the, it looks very different. Uh, instead of an annular gap, we'll have a much more prominent depletion in the inner regions. And that uh, doesn't have a name in the planetary literature. Yeah. Uh, you mean this Q? Uh, they're just rough numbers for, for alphas uh, and CO and uh, Mach numbers for quasar disks. What, what I mean is that if you'll change the mass, if you'll assume of the disk, if you'll assume now that the real disk is right. extremely heavy, right. uh, you'll assume when you... Yes, the it does. So, the, but the mass is hidden here because I took a standard Shakura Sanyab disk, with a, with a, which has, a, I actually assume, the near Eddington accretion rate an alpha of 0.1 and a uh, Mach number which is, follows from these. And uh, then these are the rough cues. That's also true because the disk mass or, uh, or uh, the Mach number actually varies with radius. This is just rough numbers. Uh, uh, and before we get to simulation, just to, so this is, I guess, step zero. I painted it here. Step two before the simulation, which will be next step, is to do this uh, exercise, which actually Dan did a couple of years ago in this paper, where you take uh, a very simple uh, setup, where you have a primary black hole here, a, per, a second black hole here, and then you just put particles, massless test particles, in circular Keplerian orbits. And then you let the system evolve for many orbits. And then you see where the particles end up after you run the system for many orbits. Uh, in this setup, this is called a restricted three-body approximation. 
there is a conserved quantity, uh, uh, which is analogous to energy or angular momentum. It's called the Jacobi constant. Based on that, you can already tell that particles that you were outside this orbit, this, this region, they, we, uh, we color them blue. That means we already know that the energy conservation or this conservation law, they can never enter inside this orbit of the secondary. The colored red particles, which by any, this conservation law, we knew already could not exit. So they had to stay there. Then there's this so-called horseshoe region where we color the particles green, where you cannot tell by energy alone. Uh, you have to actually solve the orbits and see where they end up. So you see when the mass ratio is very small, you don't do much to this bunch of particles. You just stir them around a bit. When you get to this 10 minus 3, you start evacuating this, uh, this region because this is only gravity. There's no viscosity which would fill it in. So it's uh, clearly uh, uh, evacuated. When you go to 10 minus 2, this, this, this horseshoe gap region becomes very thick. And the other thing I want you to notice, which is very useful for how you interpret these simulations, there are still most green particles. They were just ejected because they're not, they're not on stable orbits. But they're still stable orbits, and there, there are some, some particles which could stick around and follow this secondary. In the case of planets or in our solar system, these are the, the Trojan asteroids. They're just following and trailing the Earth's orbit. And you can, you can liberate here forever. Uh, when you go to a critical value of 1 to 25, you find that there's actually no stable orbits at all. Uh, they disappear. So if you put a particle anywhere in this region, uh, it's unstable and tends to be ejected. Uh, so this last plot is for point one, and then you can see it looks very different. Uh, it's basically like an entire central cavity. So that was the expectation from this. It's nice to have an expectation. And now let's look at the simulations. So I'm going to show you simulations, which again, uh, Dan made a cup, uh, for his paper two years ago. And these are just increasing numbers of Q. So this is 10 minus 3. And this is a movie. This is how many orbits the binary has gone around. And you can see it looks like a picture, even though it's a movie. That's because the system is so stable. And it looks uh, like we expected. There's a gap, although there's some nice spiral perturbations. And I'm sure you've seen this kind of picture if you've seen exoplanet talks. This is the so-called type 2 regime. And the key point here is it's very stable. Uh, if you go to 10 minus 2, uh, which normally you may not have seen because exoplanet simulators usually are not interested in uh, such a huge planet, uh, but is becoming relevant for us, but, uh, supermassive black holes, you see it still looks kind of similar. Uh, it's coughing a bit, but the accretion is quite steady. Uh, the mass ratio of 10 minus 2, and it qualitatively looks very similar. And then the big change comes in the next one, uh, where the mass ratio is just five times larger, 0.05. Now you see uh, <coughs> that this accretion is very unsteady, it's fluctuating a lot, and uh, <coughs> and uh, this gap is is uh, it still has overall roughly the same shape, but it's changing, and the accretion rate is fluctuating. So I'll show you that in a more moment, more quantitatively. But I think we understood that this is a result of the fact that there are no stable ways for the gas to viscously approach this gap and then librate around and then end up in the inner region. You cannot do that because uh, if you try to insert gas here, it tends to be flung around due to lack of stable orbits on which it could proceed. So this is important, this ha and it happens at this mass ratio of roughly 1 to 20. And then this is the equal mass case, which again looks quite different. So, so uh, uh, this uh, is a snapshot from an equal mass simulation. Let me just show you this last simulation. This one was uh, made by Yaiki Tang at NYU. And this one uh, shows a couple of additional interesting features. So this is the same thing. By the way, I didn't even describe. So I hope it was self-explanatory. This, these pictures show the surface density uh, of a two-dimensional disk you're staring at uh, from above and it's face on. And so black here means low surface density, bright orange means very high surface density. And this is in the co-rotating frame. So the, 
the black holes look like they're standing there because the movie is in the correlating frame. So what you see in this movie are basically, whoops, uh, that again, the, 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 the gas, there's a large cavity here, uh, which we kind of expected. But then what we didn't see is that from the particle uh, uh, consideration is there's gas which clearly reaches these black holes and even forms these things which look like mini disks. Uh, so black holes have their own accretion disk, which intermittently are formed and disappearing due to accretion, which is intermittent. The other important feature is this cavity becomes very asymmetric. I, when I give this talk, I often get a question, how can this be? This should be a mirror symmetric, mirror symmetric setup. But in fact, uh, uh, we think we also understood that this is due to an instability. If, if you have a perfectly symmetric two-arm stream, and one of them was slightly stronger than the other, it would uh, result in a runaway process where you push the cavity will al away due to the stronger stream, and then the cavity will turn, is going at a different uh, uh, angular velocity than the binary. When it comes around again, the, the next stream is even going to be stronger and this process runs away, which tends to make this cavity lopsided, which is also very important for what I'm gonna show next, the periodogram. Uh, of these uh, an accretion rates, but I think uh, I think I do have time to dwell on one more important point, which I think uh, I find uh, very uh, interesting. So uh, well, actually, let me first show you the accretion rates. Well, uh, oops, what happened? So these are uh, if you just take these movies that I just showed, you can measure how much mass is accreted by both black holes. And uh, this, so as I said, for the low, very low mass ratios, uh, the accretion is very steady and uh, nothing much interesting happens. It's basically uh, not shown in this figure. But uh, uh, this left panel shows you the accretion rate as a function of time for 0.05 to 0.3. This is from 0.3 to 1. And uh, the top panel, so this is for a mass ratio, and, and one example in this regime is one to nine. Uh, this is the accretion rate on the individual black holes uh, in units which are m.0. That's the accretion rate measured in a reference simulation with only one black hole with the same total mass. So this, if this was one, that would mean uh, it's a, behaving exactly like if it was one black hole. The green is the lower mass black hole and the blue is the higher mass black hole. You can see two things. First of all, uh, three things. The first thing you see is that the secondary black hole completely out accretes the primary black hole. And that's just because it's sitting farther from the center of mass and is capturing the gas from the wall of this cavity. So it's actually the, the more luminous one. Uh, then all, you can also see that the mean accretion rate uh, is actually not suppressed. It's even larger than one. So by inserting the second black hole, not only did you not depress the accretion, you actually increased slightly the accretion rate compared to a usual shakura sonyaev disk. Thirdly, there's very clear orbital uh, period that's seen in the accretion rate. Uh, uh, this bottom line is the, the bottom panel is the periodogram, and this is just accretion rate, which varies by at least 50% on the orbital period. So that's, I'm not going, to, I didn't, uh, well, I'm not even going to show this, but when you plot the luminosity as a function of time, it just looks exactly the same because the luminosity of these objects come from uh, thermal emission from the top and bottom of the disk. So it tracks this curve. You look at the larger mass ratios. So this example is 0.7. Again, here are the two black holes, uh, green and uh, blue. Again, the, the individual ones accrete at something like 0.7 or 0.7 of the single black hole rate. The sum total of the two is again, maybe even 50% higher than the single black hole. So again, this is the case of an equal mass binary, which has this large cavity, but still gas is not suppressed. It reaches the black holes at the same rate. We expect bright quasar-like sources. The second important point here is that the largest, most prominent period is actually 
six or seven times the binary's orbital period, not the binary's orbital period. Why is the green bigger than the blue? Well, because it's not exactly, it's 0.67. So again, the lower mass black hole is slightly more offset from the center of mass than the heavier one. So it's closer to the gas. So it's slightly accreting slightly more. For equal mass case, exactly Q equals one, they are the same. Uh, so the largest period is several times the binary orbital period. This is important if you want to delve into details of observations and check for periodic quasars, as I'll discuss. Uh, the, and the reason for this is something we also think we understood. It's basically what I emphasized here. Uh, when you have a binary whose mass ratio is almost equal, in particular we find this numerically 0.3 or higher, so one, two, three, or more equal, then this cavity becomes lopsided, and these uh, overdense regions develop on the edge of this cavity, which modulate the accretion rate. So we actually expect such binaries to have periodic variations on both the orbital time scale, but even more prominently on several times the orbital time scale of the binary, which corresponds roughly to the orbital time scale out here. No, so everybody finds this asymmetry for equal mass binaries, and uh, I think the best demonstration of why this is, is actually, so it has to do with streams, which if you look at the movie again, these streams are actually flying outwards. Gas is actually flying outwards and hitting the wall of the cavity, and that tends to cause an asymmetry if one stream is slightly stronger than the other. And the reason we know this, this can be seeded by numerics only in our run. But in reality, it would be seeded by some random stochastic fluctuations in the disk. And the reason we know this is the case is that uh, if you artificially put a circle here and delete from the simulation any gas that's flying outward, then this lopsidedness never develops. It remains circular. Uh, and so we actually know this has to do with the impact of these outgoing streams. So the binary conditions outside basically don't matter because they're at 100 A and uh, uh, they never propagate viscously to the inner disk. That's the zero for the answer. Okay, I, I do want to say one more thing but I'm getting a little bit late but I am amused by the fact that these accretion rates, uh, and it's another question I often get, is if you look at these accretion rates, uh, the fact that they don't match the single black hole accretion rate is kind of puzzling or interesting because you obviously cannot do this for uh, a million orbits if the, at very large radius mass is supplied by some m dot zero. In a standard shakura sanyaev picture, you have a completely steady disk uh, whose accretion rate is not a function of radius, and it's just going on forever like this. But here, if the accretion rate actually ex exceeds the externally supplied rate, it means you would pull in material faster than it's replenished. So presumably, you will develop an inner cavity which, which propagates outward. Uh, uh, and basically, we don't have a, we don't know the behavior uh, on very long time scales because we don't have simulations for a million orbits. Uh, but I think it raises one more interesting question: How, Why is this? What then sets this accretion rate? If it's not viscosity, because it doesn't match the viscous accretion rate, and I think the answer to this is is essentially it has very little to do with viscosity. Uh, it's just gravitational perturbations of the gas and resulting shocks that remove angular momentum from the gas in the rim of this cavity wall and brings them in. And again, you can actually see that also with these restricted three-body calculations. There's another picture where, where uh, we just put black particles down, zero mass test particles around the orbit of this equal mass binary. And then you follow them for actually here just 0.75 orbits. And this is a very simple behavior. In, in one quadrant, which is this quadrant, upper left, and then the other one, the lower right, uh, the particles lose angular momentum and try to move in. The other two quadrants, they move out. So these are natural gravitational torques tend to cause these kind of inward coming streams, which uh, 
would just develop again very simple nothing to do with viscosity and uh, of course these orbits cross here so you cannot take this very f much further and that's why you have to do hydro simulations but once these orbits cross you get shocks and you can and I think that's basically what determines the accretion gravitational torques and shocks not viscosity and uh, I think that's probably all I want to say so the last point in the theory part, well, actually two more, sorry. One is the spectrum. The spectrum of such an object can be quite different from a single black hole disk. And again, uh, this is the spectrum. Going back to the, this picture, you can see that the shocks which happened here uh, uh, cause dense regions, which also are hotter. If you plot it, the temperature, these would also be hot. The hot gas uh, streams and shocks in the cavity and near the black holes. And so uh, the spectrum has three parts coming from the outer disk, the uh, mini disk close to the black holes, and then the other shocked gas in the cavity. And the total spectrum looks like this. So this can be quite different from a uh, Chakura Sanyaya, this spectrum, which would just be the extension of this red one out to uh, an energy which is here. So A, this, because of the shocks uh, at strong uh, speeds, near the binary's orbit, orbital speed cause uh, large heating rates. This gas is hotter than usually. And in fact, the total luminosity is also increased compared to the shakura sanyev disk. And that's another interesting thought that this luminosity is not the dis viscous dissipation. It's ultimately coming at the expense of the binary's orbital motion. So you get to use the binary orbital binding energy as uh, your energy source and add more l luminosity to the system. Final point is on torques. So as I said, another reason to do this work is to figure out how fast the black holes would migrate. And in fact, you can even ask in which direction they would migrate. So therefore, you have to measure the torques. So this we actually done only quite recently, last year. Uh, and this panel here shows an equal mass black hole simulation. This is different from before because it's averaged over many, many orbits. This is the surface density. And then you have to do a very simple thing. You just sum up all the forces on the black holes from each patch of this disk. So this shows the torque surface density, which you get after you add all these forces. And uh, this to us was actually uh, unexpected uh, because what you see here is uh, the torque. Uh, this is linear plot, so zero means no, no no net torque on either black hole. Red is positive, blue is negative. So the binary is going uh, counterclockwise. So the red, the red regions try to add angular momentum to the binary and make it out, spi out spiral. The blue ones uh, pulling it backward uh, and uh, trying to uh, uh, lower its speed and make it in spiral. And so what you can see here uh, I think the previous notion was that this disk is the perturbations overall are very non axisymmetric You get torques from, uh, again, let's go back to this picture. Uh, so the previous notion was that you get lots of non axisymmetric structures, which will torque the binary and cause something. Uh, but in fact, it turns out what we find is that's irrelevant because the torque is completely dominated by the gas, which is actually very close time average to these black holes. And in fact, it's a subtle asymmetry between the gas ahead and behind the black hole. This is what determines the net torque. So it's neither the larger scale perturbations nor the direct accretion of momentum onto these black holes. It's this gas that's got an asymmetric distribution near the black holes that torques it. And if you only care about the bottom line, you can measure a time scale after you ass assign a scale to this simulation. And it turns out if you, if you assign, so this I won't go into details, but uh, these simulations are scale-free usually, so you have to pick a scale which corresponds to the surface mass density of the disk. If you fix one number, which is the accretion rate of the background disk in Eddington units, and you set that to be 0.3, then these torques translate to an in-spiral time of three, 3 million years. So the bottom line of this calculation is that, uh, yes, gas is very efficient in principle to bring the black holes to merge and solve this so-called final parsec problem where you cross, which I started with, where you cross uh, from few parsecs down to 10 minus 2 or 10 minus 3 parsecs. 
Uh, not if you have dense enough disks which are comparable to AGN disks. Then this in spiral is fast. A few million years. Uh, so how am I doing with time? I have five more minutes. So I was, I'm hoping to squeeze two more points then. So about observations. So if you believe everything I've said so far, uh, you could ask me these two questions which I will now answer. One is, uh, well, I said it's periodic fluctuations and we do have quasars on the sky, large numbers, and we have time domain data. So let's look for periodic quasars, and see if we find them. The second thing I want to discuss is LISA counterparts. Uh, is this what I described? Is this picture true even in the LISA regime? So on point one, I think I will go fast and just say, this is an exercise that was uh, the, the exercise of looking for periodicity in quasar light curves was done uh, only relatively recently in the last three, two, three years. Uh, one group at Caltech and one our group at Col Columbia. Uh, this one, uh, I think, is just one source which has gone away. But these two are large surveys. So the first, uh, so let me go slowly. So the, this is Catalina survey. Uh, at Caltech, they looked at uh, uh, 250,000 quasars down to this magnitude limit. They had about 10 years of data, uniform coverage, uh, uh, roughly biweekly, and they looked for periodicity uh, with some wavelet technique, and uh, they <coughs> identified 111 candidates showing significant periodicity. So as you know, all quasars fluctuate. So this is a lar relatively hairy statistics problem to decide if you're seeing significant periodicity or not. Uh, so they find 111. We looked at this other survey, which Columbia uh, was, had access to, called the Palomar Transient Factory. That's a much more uh, uh, difficult data set because it's not uniform sampling, it's heterogeneous. Uh, and, but it has data about five years of coverage, fainter, going fainter than Catalina. And because of the poor, poorer coverage, we only could analyze 36,000 quasar light curves, which had various numbers of points, but we could still find 33 candidates who's, who showed significant periodicity, which could not be explained by the usual uh, so-called dam random walk variation of quasar light curves. Uh, and uh, their periods are between one and five. Ours are shorter, up to a little over the year. And uh, well, the last one I mentioned is just, that was in Penn Stars. They only looked at 600 quasars, not these uh, tens of thousands. And they found one source, but future data showed it was not actually periodic. Uh, so I think, because I'm kind of running out of time, I should just make a comment that this is a difficult exercise. So uh, there tends to be a lot of contention because these are noisy light curves and quasars flicker, and so we have to show the periodic. And the way we do this is essentially creating random Monte Carlo realizations of this 36,000 quasar sample over and over and over, and look at periodograms and find the highest peaks, and we show that they don't happen frequently enough to explain these 33. Uh, but uh, the caveat to this is if you change a little bit the noise, uh, and you assume it's not them random walk, but some other stochastic underlying unknown variability, uh, which has a little more power on these time scales, then you could make the significance less or go away. So I think the real way to go forward here is to do this kind of exercise, find periodic quasars. Well, actually, I do have a light curve. I mean, this is an example, uh, which you can see. These are two of our examples, which show significant periodicity as far as the statistics are concerned. But the uh, way forward is to look for some other signature uh, of binary, binary nature. For example, the harder spectrum that I described compared to usual quasars, uh, unusually, broad, uh, unusually strong broad lines, because if the spectrum is harder, the broad lines will be stronger. Uh, the other uh, thing we've done, which uh, I'll mention in a minute, is uh, the so-called do Doppler modulation. So, uh, there will be an effect uh, uh, on the light curve of these binaries just from the fact that the, the black holes are moving. And if they're moving at a few percent of the speed of light, there will be Doppler modulation. 
And that, I think, is another telltale signature that you can look for in the data, because this Doppler modulation uh, is then wavelength dependent. Uh, at wavelengths where the spectrum is steeper, uh, and you move the spectrum in frequency periodically by Doppler effect, you will see larger vari variation. If a spectrum is shallower and you move it around, you see a smaller amplitude variation, which, uh, but they should be exactly in phase, just offset in amplitude. So for one object, uh, we think we could find that this uh, was the case. So in this particular quasar uh, called um, PG1302, I forgot to put the name. Yeah, here, no, PG1302. This shows light curves uh, in the UV, which we found in archival data, uh, in blue and red, uh, versus in black, the original optical light curve. And they both show are consistent with the same periodicity, but offset in amplitudes, which match the spectral slopes. So that's one kind of thing you can do. And then I think I only have one minute left, probably. But I do want to just make one point about the LISA regime, uh, which is my last point uh, uh, about the LISA regime. So here, uh, we try to address a potential very big caveat to what I said. So what I said so far was based on Newtonian hydrodynamic simulations, where we put two black holes and looked at what, is, what the gas is doing. But in the LISA band, the black hole is already gravitationally in spiraling very rapidly. And there was a notion that uh, uh, when the binary is in spiraling so fast that it's much faster than the viscous time in the nearby disk, it will effectively decouple from the disk and run away and merge in the center of this cavity, uh, essentially not seeing any and not producing any radiation. This would be bad news for LISA because uh, you would see the LISA source in the sky. You would actually know where to look several weeks before the merger with a large field telescope, but you would not see anything if this was the case. Uh, so therefore, we did a small variation of the previous simulations that I showed, uh, which, had, which differed in two ways. One is that we didn't let the binary orbit to be fixed. We actually pushed it slowly spiraling in uh, as the gravitational wave uh, emission would predict. And second, in this simulation, there was no sink because we directly resolved the innermost circular orbit. And the upshot is that, uh, that this, this cavity persists, but it's, not, uh, it's just not true what, uh, what the, the caveat kind of, or the worry doesn't materialize. Uh, so this is how the binary looks like eight days before the merger, four days before the merger, and two hours before the merger. And there's still plenty of gas that's being captured by this binary. And the essential reason for this is, this is what I mentioned earlier, the accretion onto the black holes. And the fact that gas can enter the cavity and reach the black holes is not tied to the viscous time scale. It's happening due to gravitational torques and shocks, which happen on the orbital time scale. So there's no problem bringing in more gas as the orbit shrinks. And so uh, my last slide then is the accretion rate. Uh, so I like to call this the, uh, gravitation, the X-ray chirp, which will accompany the gravitational wave chirp. And so uh, uh, these panels show uh, the in-spiral of this binary, and this is the gravitational wave signal. This is the last seven days of the orbit. This is the last one day of the LISA band observation of this binary. So this is what you're familiar with because it's chirping very fast. This is the merger. This is a week before the merger. The chirp is not so visible. Uh, but these are the ex these are the these are the fluxes that we detect we predict from the simulations at 2 keV and 10 keV. And you see that they follow. First of all, they have this long-term modulation, which I described due to the the lump at the cavity wall. Then they on top of that they do show very nicely the periodic fluctuations, which exactly track the gravitational wave signal. And it actually happens all the way down to the merger. And this is the luminosity uh, in a linear units. So this is only dropping by uh, maybe 50%. So there's no particular dimming even at the merger itself. And moreover, uh, you could tell on the sky where the source is. And you expect, in this case, to see an X-ray chirp, which tracks the gravitational wave signal. So you really should be able to identify such a source. 
I think that's enough. I should stop. Uh, and let me just put up my conclusions then. Uh, so if you want to take away a few points, I think the most important point is binaries uh, are in galactic nuclei. They are a propeller. They create a large cavity. And uh, over a large region, they expel the gas, but they're still accreting very efficiently and very uh, characteristically remain periodic all the way down in the LISA regime. <laughs> uh, we have a sample of quasars, which might represent the early stage of this binary evolution. And uh, 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 I think I'll just stop there and, uh, uh, and take questions. Do you have any? Thanks. Let me start with one thought. Those 150 trillion quasars, have you looked at them at the X-rays how they look like, or are there uh, So, uh, so uh, we have not done a thorough, proper systematic search, but yes, some of them do have X-ray data. Very few of them have time domain X-ray data. And then some of them, including uh, PG-1302, we have approved SWIFT observations, which really include X-rays. You have to be patient because I think to say anything conclusive, uh, you probably have to wait a few years, uh, comparable to the orbital period, to collect uh, X-ray data. The current ones don't seem to rule out the periodicity. Okay. I think that's a standard maybe, proposal to look. At, so. <laughs> yes. So, a question about the modification of the phasing. So, <clears throat> the gravitational wave uh, driving of the orbit. Is an extremely strong function of frequency, right? And then I guess your the gas effects are probably a, a softer function of frequency. So the, some crossing point where one, you know, yeah. where the gravitational wave one takes over, and where do you have like a sense of where that might be in terms of would it be within the Lisa band or is it something that's right? So I think the short answer to this, I was gonna show a few slides, but I think the short answer is uh, it is uh, for near equal mass binaries. By the time you're in the LISA band, gas is completely negligible. But in the case of uh, an unequal mass binary, so that will be an EMRI or IMRI input. So, uh, uh, in fact, Benza mentioned this earlier. Uh, we had a paper where we showed that uh, in that paper, uh, if you take viscous time scale as the evolution in this type 2 gapped regime, you could accumulate a few extra cycles for the EMRI in the LISA band which is actually detectable with Lisa. A <coughs> follow-up, but I, I do have actually an interesting follow-up. So this conclusion was based on simply taking a toy model torque, which is the so-called type 2 torque. It's essentially with small modification imported from the planet literature. We are doing simulations and we're actually finding uh, comparable magnitudes, but very different. In fact, the sign of the torque is different. The, the way we did it in our paper, we said that gas slightly speeds up the in-spiral. And it causes a few, few, more, few less cycles in the Lisbon, because it's moving slightly faster. In our simulations, preliminary, we find actually slightly more cycles, because uh, you can't just add these two torques linearly. You actually, when you're pushing the object with Lisa, uh, with the gravitational waves in the Lisbon, the change in the gas distribution, and the torques actually are pointing outward. But it's detect I think uh, it's detectable for a reasonable surface density. And the optimistic way of saying it is I think it's not degenerate with the post-Newtonian F uh, power law terms. So in principle, it should be distinguishable from spin or whatever other effects. So yeah, I think Lisa can do disk, disk science with embryos. Suppose you are uh, seeing detecting gravitational waves in the last uh, few days. So I, I was thinking that the two mini disks uh, probably likely shock and, and, and dissolve. And so the question is, would you see the emission from the inner rim of the cavity? Or would you see the most, uh, because I cannot 
think that the discs are so luminous because they are really tiny. The Roche lobe of this, of the size of the Roche lobe of this system is, is very, it's becoming smaller and smaller. So the question is, yeah. would you get the contribution mostly from the inner ring or from the disc, the mini discs? It is a very, very nice point. Uh, and I think you're right. Uh, in fact, in this diagram here, we keep talking about lizard sources. So this is the evolution in the lizard line. If you look at this 10 to the 6 solar mass object, to answer your question, uh, this is frequency, this is the lizard noise curve, <coughs> this is the evolution, this is the strain, characteristic strain. So the 10 to the 6 solar mass binary is moving along this curve. Yes. Uh, enters here, from here it's uh, many years to merger, from this breaking point it's 5 years to merger. This is 1 month to merger, is marked here. At this stage, your comment is not yet an issue, because at this stage, one month before the merger, that's an important point because that's when, in fact, from a paper by Benza 10 years ago, yes. we know that the object is localized on the sky to a few square degrees. So that's the point where you can actually start looking, typically with a telescope. At this point, the uh, separation of the two objects is 120 gravitation radii. And the tidal truncation radius, to, to get to your point, mm -hmm. at this point, uh, is only about uh, 40 gravitation radii. So you can, uh, so it's still actually pretty large. In fact, X-rays empirically come from 10, 10 gravitation radii. Yes. This is so in this stage, in so what you're saying is a very interesting point, and it applies only at the very end. I marked here the time, two days. That is the time when the system is so compact that the tidal truncation radii uh, is 10 short radii. And that's when what you're saying is important because the, the gas is no longer able to form a stable mini disk and they will disappear somehow. So, up to this point, up to two days before the merger, I think uh, you just have hard, hard x rays from the mini disks and softer x rays from the gas further out. And then the last two days, it's some more kind of a mess where the gas doesn't ever forms a stable mini disk and it's thrown all over, and I don't fully understand. But then you don't see the, the electromagnetic chip well, it, from it, this moment on. Uh, this this curve actually includes that, and I guess you're so you're right. So this uh, well no because this is this actually shows the last day. So even in this. Uh, this is about 20 orbits on the last day, mm -hmm. and it's still it's still looking periodic. But you cannot think of this as nice mini disk That's fuel and. But uh, it's just straight the luminosity plotted from the simulation. So it, it happens. Uh, this is in hours. So even two hours before the merger is maybe when it's less clear. Maybe we have gamma. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I think we reached our time limit, so let's thank Rock and again and give them a round of applause.